my understanding of the great founder theory, and this is just a, an excerpt that I pulled and uh, feel free to elaborate or correct any of this if it's changed, but is that you've described it as a small number that basically the, the idea that a small number of functional institutions have been founded by exceptional in individuals and that these form the core of our society. And this is, that is some, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, just this seems a decently good summary, right, of, uh, of the overall architecture of the theory. Yeah. Mm. And this is distinct from sort of the great man theory of history in a number of interesting ways, um, primarily in that there's a sort of uh, less emphasis on the historical component uh, and much more emphasis on these exceptional individuals, the ways in which they were exceptional, and also the fact that they put their exceptional, let's say, qualities to use in establishing particular institutions. Who are some of the more prominent examples uh, that come to your mind when you think about this uh, particular imp implementation of the great founder theory? I think that there is a whole number of positions in society where one might have the opportunity to create something truly new, instantiate what amounts to a completely new set of norms or social technologies. When we think of you know, great man history, we always think of uh, generals and uh, statesmen, sometimes artists, sometimes scientists. And there's certainly overlap in the kind of people you might, you might think of. Um, the difference lies that it's not the general skill at any particular battle that would make them a great founder. Rather, it would be their uh, ability and skill at reforming uh, the army as a whole, or perhaps not even in their capacity as a general, perhaps their capacity as a lawgiver, um, mm -hmm. as a legal code reformer. Uh, that would certainly, you know, for a successful enough society, for a successful enough legal code, I think that would, that would sort of justify the great founder title. Having said this, I think two evocative examples, one, you know, both very different are uh, on the one hand, Charlemagne, who I think is instrumental in transforming a tribal society of the Franks into a proper feudal society, leaning to some extent on the Catholic Church in particular, which is a, a change in the politics of the Frankish polity. The Franks, uh, you know, as many other uh, Germanic invaders into the former Roman Empire, uh, pursued a different Christianity, right? Arianism, which was considered a heresy within the borders of the Roman Empire. Uh, if I remember correctly, the Lombards of Italy are a, are a good example of such a ruling class that was at odds religiously with the uh, you know, Romans that they conquered and the Romanized uh, Gauls and Illyrians and so on. Charlemagne's reform was quite deep in that I'm not sure we would have Roman-derived uh, law dominant in continental Europe if he hadn't sponsored schools to teach scholars uh, Latin, right? This is mm. called also the Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, he's a great patron of the arts, a great patron of scholarship, despite being himself, you know, um, illiterate right? Uh, you know, literacy was not the occupation of a ruler in many literate societies, ironically. Uh, for example, only in the later Chinese dynasties that really Chinese emperors take great pride in calligraphy and their knowledge of the classics, rather than pride in uh, things like, you know, military command or political acumen. The other example uh, comes from China and Chinese history, I think Confucius definitely deserves uh, the evaluation of great founder. He created a school of thought with closely dedicated disciples that was from day one dedicated to reforming all of Chinese society. Uh, the school was just one of many during, during uh, the warring states period of Chinese history and during the so-called contention of the hundred schools. It sometimes is the case that you have the most flourishing intellectual achievements reached in the midst of political crisis. There's an argument to be made that political crisis actually opens up the possibility of thought and more importantly, rethought, right? Rethinking, unlearning what you've previously learned or previously thought that you knew uh, and approaching things anew. 
Mm. Confucius today is remembered as a traditionalist, but when he's proposing reviving ancient, long lost um, rites and practices, of course, you know, these have not been used in a very long time. Of course, what he's to a significant extent doing is inventing new things, whether or not he conceives of it that way. Reinvention is almost a necessity when you try to bring back something into existence that hasn't existed in your lifetime. And undoubtedly, uh, later Chinese society is very different uh, than what you see during the early Zhao dynasty that Confucius sets out to emulate. So his disciples from day one are seeking patronage at the elite level and have a theory where if you correct you know, the education of the ruling class, and if you correct affairs at court, these changes radiate outward. In a way, we could contrast this theory of change with the Western theory of change, which is sort of, you know, you go to the peripheries of society and then slowly this cultural change seeps in from the periphery into the center, right? We prefer a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. Mm. But China was a very top-down society and um, the Confucian perspective was incredibly humanizing compared to the alternatives to other legalist alternatives. Um, the school found itself suppressed at a certain point during the Qin dynasty, um, followed by the golden age of the Han, where it was indoor, you know, embraced and hybridized with, uh, you know, with legalist thinking. And Confucian thought among the elite class of Chinese scholars has been sort of revived every few centuries ever since. So really, really an important force, right? You could imagine this as a gravitational pull, uh, sort of pulling Chinese civilization in a particular direction, century after century. It's not that there aren't other big important factors, such as, you know, the Mongol conquests, or, uh, you know, maritime trade during the Song Dynasty, or technical advancements, or the spread of a Buddhist teaching and meditation and so on. It's just that the Confucian schools keep being refounded and keep impacting civil administration and keep impacting law. And perhaps this is where I can tie it back to Charlemagne. Mm. It's not that there are not other successful medieval European kings. It's just that few lived in such a, few lived in an age or an era where the opportunities existed to produce first this expansive political order and then within this expansive political order, just reform the fundamentals of their society. When later pagan king, kings across Europe are, you know, converting uh, to Christianity, they're actually converting to Charlemagne's model. They're not just adopting Christianity into a tribal structure. They're copying a lot of these, what will come to be thought of as Frankish institutions. Hmm. Uh, so it sounds to me like from the two examples that you've given that are characteristic of what you're describing in this theory, um, that in both cases, there's sort of a, a crisis in the society, which is seized upon to introduce reforms, right? And these could be inventions of brand new modes of doing things, or they can be reinventions that is pulling from the past and bringing them up to the future, or to the present rather, Um but in either case, uh, there's sort of a, an opening, uh, a sort of a gap in which this change can occur and can be implemented. And then whether or not it's lasting, I, I, I think we can get into I, this is sort of my next, my next question. But do you think that it necessarily um, is the case that there needs to be a crisis point in order for this kind of reform to happen? I think that, you know, if there isn't a crisis point, and growth and evolution and deep reform are successfully undertaken. I think people just call that a golden age. So mm. uh, I would say that, no, sometimes things just go very, very well. Uh, it is, however, the case, though, that for whatever reason, and actually there are numerous reasons that I've written about as well, um, institutional stagnation can be locked in very quickly, right? So. If you have a century or two of institutional innovation, that's almost the best I've ever seen, right? That's the best I've seen in almost any um, societal context. Um, a good example might be, you know, classical Greece, Renaissance Italy, the early modern era, 
these are periods of intense social and intellectual innovation where importantly you know uh, you know every innovation sort of spurs additional innovation right perhaps there is dynamism a competition and of mm -hmm. course wherever there is competition there is urgency so possibly what i'm saying is that uh, you know the civilization as a whole need not be in crisis but maybe the city states or the kingdoms or uh, you know, the religious groups that are undertaking innovation within this thriving civilization, maybe they are in some kind of crisis. And why, why, does, um, why does political crisis especially or political achievement um, often lead to, this, to these opportunities? I think it's just because uh, so many of the stakeholders are missing, right? Stakeholders solidify an outcome, right? The rope is where it is. The only way to move the rope into a new direction is uh, to either pull sideways or, you know, if uh, half, of, half of the people pulling suddenly disappear. And when it came to various political disasters in the history of China, that was often the case, right? Um, part of the success of the Confucian school of thought rests in that they were able to survive a period of persecution by the Qin. There was a particular event called uh, the burning of books and burying of scholars. And, you know, pretty self-explanatory name. I love how in Chinese history, they gave these, you know, fairly self-explanatory names to these, to these events. Uh, all schools of thought under the Qin emperors uh, were suppressed. Uh, a lot of works were destroyed. A lot of scholars were killed. Uh, the legalists were ascendant, but the Confucians sort of survived this filter. So, you know, often the crisis point uh, means that you don't have a lot of competition, which means you have a lot of leeway to design things very differently.